The Laughing Cavalier here, presenting to you another tale of these troubled times. When I started this channel, my original intention was to keep focused on primarily Stuart and possibly Tudor history, but, ever since I was little, I've had a fascination with the sinking of the RMS Titanic in 1912, and, since this month is the anniversary of the sinking, I thought I would deviate from my usual videos and do a review on one of my favourite films of all time, A Night to Remember. Based off of the successful book by Walter Lord, A Night to Remember is seen to this day as one of the most authentic films covering the sinking of the RMS Titanic. Starring Kenneth Moore as 2nd Officer Charles Lightoller, Michael Goodliffe as Thomas Andrews, and Lawrence Naismith as Captain Edward Smith, along with a host of others, it is not focused on one single set of main characters, but rather, it tells the story of multiple people, both real and semi-fictional. Does it deserve this reputation? Well, let us see in this review of A Night to Remember. Before I begin, I would highly recommend the book that this is based off of, and its sequel, The Night Lives On, where Walter Lord provided some corrections following the discovery of the wreck. I will also recommend you check out the Encyclopedia Titanica forum, where there are a lot of discussions regarding all aspects of the ship. Finally, the website of Dr. Paul Lee, who has written some interesting articles regarding the Titanic, including very detailed analyses of the errors in Titanic films. His page on the errors of a night to remember has been invaluable. The film opens in 1911 with the launch of the RMS Titanic, I name this ship Titanic. May God bless her and all who sail in her. Yeah, right off the bat there are a few errors. The Titanic didn't have a bottle of champagne thrown at it like it would expect with a ship launching. It's basically just launched without much ceremony and fanfare. A few things I should mention as well. Since there's only about 20 seconds or so of actual footage of the Titanic that survives, the film had to use clips of other liners, particularly the Titanic sister ship, the Olympic, the Cunard Lions Lusitania, and even the Queen Mary. But since this was made in the 50s, it can be excused for this since CGI wasn't even a thing. Hell, I still see documentaries of the Titanic to this day using newsreel footage of the Lucy in place of the Titanic. After the opening credits, we fast forward to 1912 and see a train travelling through the English countryside. It is in this scene that we are introduced to Charles Lightoller, played by Kenneth Moore, and his wife Sylvia, played by Jane Downs. Mr. This, Sylvia. The new White Star Liner, RMS Titanic, is the largest vessel in the world. It is not only in size, but also in the luxury of her appointments that the Titanic takes first place among the big steamers of the world. By the provision of Vinolia Otto toilet soap for her first class passengers, the Titanic also leads as offering a higher standard of toilet luxury and comfort at sea. <laughs> For the first class passengers, Mark, you, the rest don't wash, of course. Excuse me, sir, but are you a foreigner? Me? Eh? Or a radical, perhaps? I ask because my wife and I find your sneering remarks in bad taste. What's that? Let those who wish to belittle their country's achievements do so in private. Every Britisher is proud of the unsinkable Titanic. Yes, indeed. I'm sure my husband would agree with you. He's going to join the Titanic as her second officer. Mm. I, uh, I apologize. Misunderstanding, of course. Oh, of course, madam. Soap is no laughing matter. I should mention an inaccuracy here at this point, and that is accents. Lightoller was actually interviewed in the 1930s, and as you can hear, he has something of a Lancashire accent. All hands on deck. And I met my watch tumbling up on the boat deck just as I got there. And the boat deck, just in case you don't know, is the top deck of all. This is not just limited to Lightoller, though. His wife was actually Australian. Benjamin Guggenheim here was actually American. I see your valley knows where you are. This thing's uncomfortable. It hurts. Frederick Fleet was from Liverpool. Say, you won't drink all the coca down there, will you? <laughs> and Thomas Reverend Andrews was from Ulster. New York, too. It'll be a proud moment for you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, and for you, Andrews. <laughs> You're the man who built her. Not to mention, there are probably some others I've missed out. They do their job well, though, but it is still a shame that some accents were not taken into consideration for many of the characters. After this, we get some scenes of passengers leaving for the Titanic. I would tell you their names, but quite often, other than first names, the film doesn't tell us. Yeah, that is another problem you'll find with the film. Apart from historical characters like Lytoller, Smith, etc., Many of the major characters in the film are either composite characters or historical figures, but with different names. The best example would be Sir Richard and his wife here, who are based off of Sir Cosmo and Lady Duff Gordon. 
The events that happen to these composite characters are true to varying degrees, but are taken from the experiences of other real-life passengers on the ship. Sometimes the experiences of several are rolled into one, which, to be fair, is understandable when you have two hours to cover so many people, but it still would have been nice to focus on some more real-life passengers. Oh, and a quick little point about Light Holler. You think they'll promote her to first officer after this trip, Bertie? Well, that depends whether they keep old Wild on or not. After all, you were first on the Majestic. Ah, but that was temporary. This is referring to the fact that Lightoller was actually meant to be the first officer on the Titanic. However, the original second officer, David Blair, was removed from the crew to make way for Henry Wilde as chief officer, bumping down William Murdoch to first officer and Lightoller to second. However, Lightoller, in all likelihood, kept his first officer's uniform rather than the change into a second one, as shown by this photo taken in Queenstown, Monday Cobra, on the 11th of April, since he assumed he would probably be promoted back to his old rank after the maiden voyage. The film is aware of this change of rank, but still, he has with him his second officer's uniform, although, again, it is a minor error in the grand scheme of things. We now move to April the 10th, as the Titanic takes on passengers in Southampton, and are now introduced to Captain Edward John Smith, played by Lawrence Naismith, Thomas Andrews, the ship's designer, played by Michael Goodliffe, and John Bruce Ismay, head of the White Star Line, played by Frank Lawton. Morning, sir. Good morning, pilot. I understand the engine right, we have been tested. Right, send Captain. Yes, sir. Yes, they have. Thank you, sir. Well, there should be quite a welcome waiting for us in New York, too. It'll be a proud moment for you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, and for you, Andrews. <laughs> You're the man who built her. You're the one who ought to take the bows. <laughs> I'm only the office boy. We should arrive, uh, let's see, a Wednesday morning. Oh, we might do better than that. Not out for a fast run this trip, are you? Oh, no, 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 nothing like that. You'll do better when the engines have settled down. Yes. Oh, naturally, Captain, you'll use your own judgment. <laughs> I'm just an ordinary passenger on this trip. And so the Titanic set sail on its fateful voyage. The film now cuts to Sunday, April the 14th, where the passengers are enjoying the voyage. See? Steady as a rock. That's remarkable. <laughs> Of course, the sea is dead calm at the moment. All the same, Captain, dead calm or not, there are lots of other ships that'll be rolling anyway. That's perfectly true. As you say, sir, she's as steady as a rock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Someone must have jogged the tail. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Oh, interesting fact. Ismay actually never dined at the captain's table. He usually dined with the purser, something they do briefly show later in the film, but not in this particular scene. He did have tea with the captain sometimes, though. We are also introduced to the SS Californian and its captain, Stanley Lord, who will play, or rather controversially not play, a role in the events that followed. Yes, sir. What is it? More ice warnings from steamers ahead, sir. One from the America and another from the Baltic. Mm. South of Cape Race. Them then pack ice come that far south before, sir. Been a mild winter up in the Arctic. This ice must be drifting down on the Labrador current. Well, our passengers aren't in any hurry. Wouldn't be with us if they were. Santa could also get some ice warnings as well. Messages for the captain. Oh, very good, Sparks. Would you see you get some right away? Certainly. Excuse me, sir. From the wireless room. Thank you. Excuse me. Ice warnings from steamers ahead of us. Excuse me. Serious? Oh, we shall keep a sharp lookout. Now, the film does get the order with the ice warnings and when they're received a bit wrong. We first get two messages delivered to the captain at once. The Californian is then forced to stop because of the ice, so the captain instructs the Californian's wireless operator, Cyril Evans, to warn other ships in the area about the ice, which is later related to Titanic's chief wireless operator, Jack Phillips, referred to as John in the movie, played by Kenneth Griffith. Later, another message, this time from the SS Masaba, warns the Titanic of icebergs. However, it is muddled up in some other messages and left on the side under a paperweight, unseen by anyone. Finally, there is the infamous warning sent to the Californian to the Titanic. Here's our position as near as I can work it out. Uh, the old man says he gave you the rest of the message. That's right. <laughs> Mr. 
What's the matter? What's she say? She says, keep out. Now he's calling Cape Race again. Yeah, that last bit happened more or less as it did in real life. Although some have said that the Californian didn't really take offence to it. Overall, then, these are all the ice warnings that we see in the film. In reality, it went something more like this. To be fair, though, the film doesn't have long to go into detail about the wireless messages, and there is still some mystery regarding some messages, particularly the one from the Basaba. Meanwhile, aboard the Titanic, it is now evening, and third class are dancing downstairs. And the first class are having dinner. Okay, a quick point on the sets. Broadly, they done pretty well, given the fact that, at the time, a lot of information on the Titanic, such as its deck plans, were lost in the archives and other places. This meant that a lot of sets were based off of the Olympic, the Titanic sister ship, which is not 100% like those of the Titanic. In the 1920s, for example, the Olympic's grand staircase was painted white to reflect the style of the time, and it does look like the makers of the film based the Titanics off of this. However, the grand staircase in 1912 was actually dark wood in colour. There are quite a few other mistakes like this throughout the film. However, since I'm trying to get this review as brief as I can, I won't be listing all of them. Paul Lee covers most of them on his website, so do check them out there if you are interested. At the first class dinner scene, we are introduced to Margaret Brown, played by Tucker Maguire. Leadville Johnny, they call him. And he was the best gold darn gold miner in Colorado. Fifteen I was when I married him. Really? Mm-hmm. And he didn't have a cent. Well, three months later, he struck it rich. And we was millionaires. You know what he did? Yeah. He built me a house. And he had silver dollars cemented all over the floors of every room. I say, how bad it does it, Now, you may be asking yourself, Cavalier, surely don't you mean Molly Brown? You know, the unsinkable Molly Brown. Well, that is because she wasn't called Molly. They made a stage play about her in the 50s and decided that the unsinkable Margaret Brown didn't really work so well, so they renamed her to Molly and... Sadly, the name has stuck ever since, the point that pretty much every move about the Titanic gets her name wrong. Evening, sir. Evening, Jimmy. Any troubles? No, sir. She's a beautiful job. Thank you, Haskin. Good night, sir. I do like this scene with Andrews. Andrews was the nephew of Lord Peary, the owner of the Harland and Wolf shipyard who built the Titanic. He'd started off as an apprentice at Harland and Wolf and... Even though he was now a high-ranking figure in the shipyard, he sometimes visited the boiler rooms and the engine room to see how things were, although he usually wore overalls when doing this. Now as the Titanic makes its way across the ocean, I want you to tell me what is wrong with this scene. You might not get it at first, so I'll play this clip from earlier in the film to help you. First class, 332, sir. 276 second, 708 steerage. Uh, total with crew, 2,208, sir. Now the Titanic had capacity for 3,500 people. If you haven't got it yet, I will tell you. Why are all the lights on? If the ship is 1300 below full complement, then why are the cabins fully lit, even the empty ones? Not to mention this is now evening, so people most likely be at dinner and not in their cabins. This isn't the only film guilty of this, though. James Cameron did the same, and pretty much every other Titanic-related film has as well. Visually, it looks nice to have Titanic lit up like a Christmas tree gliding across the sea, but it does raise some questions. A bit later on, and Lightoll is relieved by First Officer Murdoch. They look out being warned to keep their eyes skinned for ice. Uh, I think that's about the lot. I'm off on the rounds. Thanks, Ike. Uh-huh. You're welcome to it. Good night. After this, he goes into the first class where some passengers have questions. And uh, Hock and Seltzer for the ladies. Is that correct, sir? Uh, that's right. Now, look here. You're sure about this full speed trial tomorrow? That's what I heard from one of the officers, sir. Uh, I can't guarantee it, naturally. Well, here's somebody who ought to be able to tell us. Hey, Lieutenant. Sir? Uh, good evening, ladies. Uh, have a drink. Oh, thank you, no, sir. I'm on duty. We've decided to win the sweep on the ship's run tomorrow. Now, rumour has it the captain's going to see how fast she can go. Is that right? It's possible. Uh Uh-huh. Now, what would be your guess about the run, Lieutenant? Oh, I don't think I ought to tell you that, sir. Why not? Well, wouldn't you feel worried about betting on a certainty? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't think there was any speed test planned for the next day. Whether that rumour did spread on the Titanic, I'm not sure. Also, as Lytola says, I am on duty. So unless his duty requires him to be chatting with passengers and wandering around first class, then he shouldn't really be there. Here, lads. We're trying to find our bunks. Well, you can't come this way. It's the second class. Oh, sorry. No offence, lad. OK, how did they get here in the first place? There were waist-high gates they would have had to climb over. I'm amazed they got this far without being caught. Winning a lot, is he? Pardon? 
You know the one I mean. Oh, well, yes, sir, he is. Ah, I thought I'd seen him before. Majestic, I think it was. The name of Rogers, sir. Oh, it was Yates last time. Can they afford to lose? Wealthy gentlemen, sir. Again, another nice little touch. Walter Law does make mention of this in his book. Come in. Hello, Doc. What can I do for you? You can stop working on this grand ship of yours and have a nightcap. Well, I got one here. This is sound medical advice I'm giving you. Come in. What is this? Restaurant galley hot press not working. Alterations needed to the writing room. Too few screws on the stateroom coat hooks. Also another nice little touch and a reference to the book. An hour is getting late into the night and life on board the ship is settling down. There are some scenes of waiters clearing away dishes, bakers making bread for the next day and so on. I think they really do help build the atmosphere. There's virtual silence right up until this fateful scene. What did you see? Iceberg, get ahead sir! Iceberg, dead ahead, sir. Hard to starboard. Hard to starboard, sir. Full of sun, both. Full of sun, both, sir. Close watertight doors. Close watertight doors, sir. Hard to starboard it is, sir. Now, I know I'm not meant to be comparing it to Cameron's 1997 Titanic, but I have to say that, in my opinion, this version of the collision scene is much more impactful and tense. There's no overdramatic music and shouting and so on. It's very quiet up until the moment the iceberg hits, when all hell is let loose. Iceberg, sir. I put a harder starboard and reversed the engines, but she was too close. Stop engines. Stop engines. I tell you, she's throwing a propeller blade. I was in the old Majestic when the same thing happened. There. We'll be going back to Belfast. You see. Well, there's nothing to see up on deck. I'm going back to bed. Good night. Good night. Oh, what's the trouble? Oh, nothing serious, sir. In a few hours, we'll be on our way again. Yeah, the reaction of the passengers is pretty accurate. Men, in fact, didn't even feel the bump and were only woken up when the order to evacuate was given. She's making water fast, sir. The mail hold's practically full already. Aren't the pumps working? Yes, sir. Thank you, Carpenter. But the engine rooms say they'll need more. They're rigging them now. This is most unfortunate, Captain. Yes, sir. Do you think the ship is seriously damaged? I'm afraid she is. Excuse me. Uh, how long is this likely to delay us? Not long, I... You struck a bird. I think she's badly damaged. I'd like to know how badly. All right. I'll go down and have a look. Actually, Smith also went with Andrews to inspect the damage, rather than just Andrews. This was probably round about midnight. Now, this is an old legend from the Titanic story, that the passengers played football with the ice. It is some basis in truth. Some passengers did look at the ice and kick it around a bit, but they didn't organise a proper football match like they do in the film. Things don't stay cheery for long, though. Below decks, things are looking even worse. Anything more you want to see? No. Chief, I get those men up as soon as you can. Yes, I'll, I'll do that, Mr. Andrews. Andrews returns to Captain Smith to tell him his assessment of the damage. Water in the fore peak. Numbers one and two holes. The mail room and boiler room six and five. That means a gash 300 foot long from there to there, below the water line. Do you agree? Yes. Well? The pumps are keeping the water down in this boiler room, but the first five compartments are flooding. Well, what's the answer? She's going to sink, Captain. But she can't sink. She's unsinkable. She can't float. Look, she could float with any three of her first five watertight compartments flooded. She could even float with four of them gone. But she can't float with all five full up. Yes, but... These watertight bulkheads here only go as high as E-deck. The weight of water in the bow is going to pull her down by the head. So you're going to get the fifth watertight compartment overflowing into the sixth, the sixth into the seventh, and so on as she gets lower. It's a mathematical certainty. With that amount of underwater damage, she can't stay afloat. 
How long will she last? Just trying to work that out now. As far as I can see, she made 14 feet of water in the first 10 minutes after the collision. It's not very fast. She should live another hour and a half. Yes, about that, I think. Now, we don't know for sure the exact sequence of events regarding when they realised the ship was lost. A little after midnight, Smith and Andrews were seen returning from below. Whether they went to Andrews' cabin, we do not know. According to the fourth officer, Boxall, he claimed that the captain said that Mr Andrews give us an hour to an hour and a half. So this is where that line comes from. Gentlemen, we are in a precarious position. We must be prepared to abandon ship. Mr Murdoch, you will muster the passengers. Mr Lightoller, you will have the boats uncovered and swung out. Mr Boxall, call all hands and get them to boat stations. Mr Moody, you will help Mr Lightoller. And Mr Wilde and Mr Pittman will remain on the bridge. Everything will be done quietly and calmly. There must be no alarm and no panic. Two hours later. <laughs> Okay, sorry, sorry, I couldn't help myself. I, I promise no more overused memes. And so the boats are uncovered and the crew prepares to evacuate the ship. Whilst this is happening, Captain Smith goes to the wireless room. The ship is badly damaged. Send out the call for assistance. The regulation distress call, sir? Yes, and at once. As soon as you're in touch with the ship nearest to us, tell them to come as quickly as they can. You understand? Yes, sir. That's our position. Yes, sir. I just want to focus on the clock for the moment. Notice the GMT beneath it, which stands for Greenwich Meridian Time. Now to see what time zone that covers and, ah, uh, oh, it's, it's miles away from the Titanic. Still, if Phillips wants to know the time in London, then he's covered. Meanwhile, back on the Californian. What about that steamer over there? Who is she? I don't know. I suppose she's in the ice too. She stopped at about seven bells. I tried calling her with the Morse land, but she didn't take any notice. Well. Me for bed. Right. Good night. Good night, sir. Yeah, this is a slight exaggeration of what happened. Groves did go down to Evans and pick up the headphones, but the Marconi had been switched off and Groves did not switch it back on like in the film. As he claimed later on, he could have understood a distress call if he had heard it, but he didn't. Meanwhile, the stewards are telling the passengers the captain's orders. Come in. Sorry to disturb you, sir, but uh, captain's orders. What is it? Uh, there's a little trouble with the ship. Everyone's to put on warm clothing, get their life belts on, and go up on deck. What? It's only a precaution, ma'am. Excuse me, sir. Everybody up, get dressed, get your life belts on at once. Everybody up, get dressed, get your life belts on at once. I say, you get dressed, get life belts. Quick, savvy, chop, chop. Get your life belts and get dressed. Get your life the clip of the third class stewards rudely telling everyone to get dressed and get the life jackets on may be a little over the top. For what we can tell, most third class passengers have already become aware of the danger. The men were situated in the forward part of the ship and were well aware that something was wrong. Most had probably already moved forward and woken the women and children situated in around the stern by this point. The stewards probably didn't need to wake the third class passengers. Come on, get up, we're sinking. Get out of it. Oh, fine. Everybody up! Captain's orders! Why don't you put the light out? Hooligans. This event is again based off actual testimony of a survivor, although the film's version is slightly different. Of course, then I walked into my cabin, uh, number seven glory hall, and I opened my box, I called everybody, I said, come along fellas, get up, she's going down. 
So they, uh, I opened my box, took out some matches, some cigarettes, and I said, come on, fella, get out. What the hell are you talking about? They said, get out of here. And someone threw a boot at me. I said, good night, gentlemen. Just as easy as that. Really, it's too tossable for me. Everybody knows this ship can't sink. And no, I did not edit that last clip. Meanwhile, aboard the RMS Carpathia, the wireless operator Harold Cotton hears something worrying on the wireless. No, they struck a bird. They want us to come at once. They're sinking. The Titanic? Don't be a fool. It's true! I'm going to the captain. There's nothing inside. Take over. Right. Now, things happened a little differently in real life, at least as Cotton himself related in this interview from 1956. Now, Mr. Cotton, the Titanic called you in distress. What was your reaction? Well, uh, she didn't call me. I, I called her. Uh -huh. uh, about, uh, about one o'clock in the morning, uh, after I'd taken the press, or listen to the press, I took a batch of, batch of message for, for her, and with the intention of redirecting them onto her, I called her up. And the only reply I got that she'd struck ice. And I said, was it serious? And she said, yes, this is a CQD, old man. Uh, here's the position, report it, and get, get here as soon as you can. So I took the position and on a scrap of paper and rushed up to the bridge with it. When I got on the bridge, I contacted the officer of the watch, and the information didn't seem as though it had sunk as fast as I thought it ought to, so I rushed down off the, uh, down the ladder and, to, uh, and knocked on the captain's cabin, and as I saw a light, I rushed in. And he said, uh, who the hell, or words to that effect. Sir, sir, what the devil's going? Haven't you learned to knock before you come in here? It's a distress call, sir, from the Titanic. She's sinking. I'm sorry, sir, I... Mr. Dean, turn the ship round. Head northwest. I'll work the course out for you in a minute. Aye, sir. Now, Cotton. You're sure this is the Titanic? Yes, sir. Sir, absolutely. All right, check back. Find out everything you can. Tell them we're coming as fast as possible. Yes, sir. Ah, oh, I didn't realise Vladimir Putin modelled himself after Captain Rostron. And so, aboard the Titanic, the lifeboats have rung out, and Bride relates to Smith the news that the Carpathia is on the way. We've contacted the Carpathia, eastbound from New York. She's on her way to us. Well, how far away is she? 58 miles, sir. She's making all possible speed. Should reach us in four hours. Four hours? Yes, sir. Well, what about that ship over there? About 10 miles away. You can see a light. Isn't she replying? No, sir. Well, she'd blast our ears off if she did. Maybe she can't keep a 24-hour watch. Maybe she hasn't got wireless at all, sir. All right, Bride, thank you. Mr. Moody! Sir? Tell Mr. Boxall to fire the distress rockets. One every five minutes from the port side. Aye, aye, sir. And so it begins one of the most controversial parts of the whole Titanic saga, the actions that night of the SS Californian. Even to this day, the ship that stood still remains a hotly debated topic amongst Titanic historians, and it is good to see the film address this. Port side birds all swung out, sir. Shall I fill them? Yes. Put the women and children in and... Blow away. Aye, aye, sir. Now, this happened a little differently according to Lightoller. Just a little while before they were ready to swing out, I happened to meet the captain. And I asked him, by cupping my hands over his ear and yelling at the top of my voice, shall I get the women and children away, sir? He just nodded. So I started to fill the first boat. And so the evacuation begins, and the film does a good job of relating some of the problems encountered that night in regarding to getting passengers into the boats. Just this short minute or so brilliantly tells us the three main reasons why many refuse to enter the boats. Many women do not want to leave their husbands. Please, madam, I'll pass the children across. What about my husband? I'm sorry, women and children first. Yes, my dear, I think you better have. But in a small boat like that, I can't go without my husband. That lady's right. 
It's absolutely sure ridiculous. Men that want to get into the small boat and sail about on the freezing waters. Now, would you be good enough to step into the boat, please, madam? Catch my death of cold? Certainly not. And, probably most importantly, men do not see any danger, and soon they'll be back on board by morning. Eileen! Eileen! Yes? You won't get back on board tomorrow without a pass! <laughs> Down below deck, though, the crew are desperately trying to keep the ship afloat as long as possible. Well, well, there. What's the use, Chief? Well, all the pumps will fast would never keep that water down. That may be so, but the longer we can keep her afloat, the more lives will be saved. So put your backs into it. Please, will you tell me what's going on, Robert? People have been rushing about and noises overhead. Wait a minute. I've seen her somewhere before. Who are you? My name is Pussy Galore. I must be dreaming. Yup, Honor Blackman. Probably one of the most famous Bond girls is on the Titanic. And apparently quite a few actors who are in the Bond films were in the night to remember as well, including Desmond Llewellyn, who some may remember as Q. They'll be opening the lower deck ports when the orders are given. Oh, they will, will they? This is even claimed that Sean Connery himself was an extra in this film, although I can't really see him in any of the scenes. Oh, and for the Star Wars fans, apparently Jeremy Bullock, who played Boba Fett, was in the night to remember, and played a boy who jumps in the water at some point in the film, although, again, I have no idea where. Now, a bulkhead did collapse according to lead fireman Frederick Barrett, but by this point there was only a skeleton crew left in Boiler Room 5, and there was no warning when it gave way, at least according to Barrett. Meanwhile, the third-class passengers are gathered in their common room, having no idea what to do, save for a few souls who are on their own decide to head up top. You can't go through here. This is not the way to the steerage boat deck, I've told you. Which is the way, then? They'll be opening the lower deck ports when the orders are given. Oh, they will, will they? We'll soon see about that. Yeah, this is one of the more controversial aspects of the sinking, and, unfortunately, a lot of it has been exaggerated and garbled over the years. These gates are referred to as Bostwick Gates, and if the film and subsequent adaptations of the Titanic story are to be believed, then the ship has some of these gates to keep the steerage passengers separate from the higher decks. In reality, there were barely any on the Titanic. Most were situated to keep passengers from accessing a select few areas, as shown on the Titanic's deck plans. Possibly a few more may have been added in the meantime, although we cannot be sure. To be fair to this film, though, there is only really one or two instances shown of the Boswick Gates. Other than that, it's mainly weight high gates, with signs on them showing the separate classes. I'm going to have to cut down more steam. I'll have to get rid of some of the load, then, sir. Yeah. Well, you can cut the boiler room fans for a start. That'll help. Good. How are things up top, sir? Any chance for us? Whatever happens, we've got to keep the lights going. I'll give the word when it's time to go, and then it's every man for himself. But it won't be so bad. They say the Carpathia's on her way to us. Should be here any time now. OK, this here is Chief Engineer Joseph Bell. How did he get word that the Carpathia is coming? Did he go up top and speak to Captain Smith at some point? As far as I'm aware, he was busy below decks most of the time, although I suppose it's feasible he could have reported to the Captain from time to time. Whether he heard about the Carpathia coming, I've no idea, but I doubt it. Speaking of the Carpathia... Cut your heating and hot water. Cut anything you like. I've got to have every ounce of steam you can give me. Aye, aye, sir. All right, Mr. Dean. Sir, get all hands on deck and prepare to receive survivors. Knock off all routine work, get your boats ready and swing them out. Rig electric lights down the side of the ship. Open all gangway doors. Hook a block of nine rope in every gangway door. Canvas slings. Get those ready for the engine. Oh, and see that all your side ladders are down. Have you got that? Aye, aye, sir. All right. Back on the boat deck, people are starting to get concerned. Now this, well. no, this does seem a bit odd since, as we know, many of the lifeboats were loaded with empty spaces. I'm not sure what time this is meant to take place, although I'm guessing this is meant to be life at number 10, since Chief Page Jochen here was meant to be on that boat but didn't board it as he does in the film. Now, this was at 1.50am, about half an hour before the ship sank, and it left with 40 people, so the excuse that the boat is full in this scene seems odd, although... Again, this is probably not live at number 10, since I'm sure that this is meant to be earlier on in the sinking, which case Jochen here is rather early. Quickly! Come along, you men! Quickly! Hold it! What the...? Will you kindly not 
not interfere, sir. We've got to get these boats away. We are getting them away. You want me to drown everybody? Because that's what will happen if I lower these boats too quickly. Now stand back, please. Now, this incident also happened, although it was actually 5th Officer Lowe who reprimanded Bruce Ismay. The film does this as a bit, though, giving lines spoken by other officers to Lightoller, although, seeing as though Kenneth Moore was something of a major star at the time, from a filmmaking point of view, you would want him to have a few more lines. And now we return to the saga of the Californian. That's six rockets she's fired, sir. Yes. Maybe I'd better tell the captain. What is it? No big steamer, sir. She's firing rockets. Six up to now. Or perhaps they're company signals of some kind. Call her up with a Morse lamp and ask her. Aye, aye, sir. The captain thinks she must be signaling to another ship about the ice. Looks a bit queer, doesn't she? I'll try signaling her again. As if she's listing. That's because of the angle she's at to us. Yeah, this is pretty much what happened. Well, from what we can tell. However, there are quite a few parts to the Californian story that will take ages to explain in this review, so I'll leave a select few articles that discuss it further if people are interested. Again, this is loosely based on what happened, but not quite what occurred. As time went on, I could see the bows of the ship getting steadily lower and lower in the water. Now, between lowering one boat and another, I frequently took a run forward and a quick look down a long stairway that led from the boat deck three or four decks down. Frankly, I'm never likely to forget the sight of that Cold, greenish water, creeping step by step up that stairway. Some of the lights were shining down on the water, and others, already submerged, were giving it a sort of ghastly transparency. Meanwhile, some of the third-class passengers think they found a way and head up to the top, whilst on the boat deck, the passengers are beginning to get a bit frightened. No, I won't! I won't! Women and children first, ma'am. Please, Lottie, for God's sake, be brave and go. I'll get a place in another boat. Come on, Lottie, please. Robert, I can't go through. It looks as though we shall have to forego the drive down to Philadelphia and take the train. I can't leave you here, Robert. Cousin Henry won't mind us being one day late, but he'll draw the line at two. I'm not going, Robert. My dear, I never expected to ask you to obey me, but this is one time you must. It's only a matter of form for you and the children to go first. Everyone here will be quite safe. Is that the truth? Certainly it is. If you please, madam, the children will follow. Now, as mentioned but earlier, characters like Robert and Liz here are fictional, but they might as well be real. A lot of male passengers stayed behind whilst their wives and children got into the boats. There are a lot of similar stories to this, so I think given the fact that the film is only two hours long, it is fine for many of the passengers to be represented by this one family. Meanwhile, these third-class passengers are still trying to find their way to the boat deck. Let's follow somebody, Pat. Oh, I'm getting chucked out. No, no, let's try this way. Now, this does raise one of the reasons why the survival rate for third class was lower. A lot of the passengers had no idea how to get to the boat deck and, as seen before, had uncooperative crew to deal with who did not grasp the full extent of the ship's danger. However, the film does have this scene in it. Okay, Mary. I don't like the news of it. We're going up. Just a minute. You'll be told when to go up. To go up. <laughs> Whilst not as bad as some later films, and loose a bit off one account, this probably did not happen. It's unlikely that stewards were kept to block off the third-class passengers in the common room. In fact, they had their own deck they were allowed onto. True, there were the aforementioned crew who kept some doors guarded, but I doubt it was to this extent. To be fair, at the time this film was made, there were barely any third-class accounts of the disaster. Hold it! If you please, sir. But there's room in the boat, I thought... I... Women and children only! Yeah, the film does gloss over this a bit and make that to be a by-the-book thing Lightoller is doing by keeping men from entering the boat. Lightoller was responsible for sending many of the boats off without having fully loaded them, thinking it was women and children only rather than women and children first, which would lead to some unnecessary deaths that night. I thought you 
thought you'd gone to the boat. My pig, I must have my lucky pig. Well, well... Again, another nice little touch. This did happen, although, in reality, Edith Russell was American, and the pig was a lot different to the one in the film. She's shown later playing the musical pig in the boat to cheer up the children, which, again, is accurate. Meanwhile, Captain Smith inquires about the light on the horizon. Don't they see us? No, sir. There was a light flashing, but it must have come from their masthead. Quartermaster Rowe. Sir? Can you send and read Morse? Yes, sir. Then signal and keep signalling. We are the Titanic sinking. Please have your boats ready. Aye, sir. You go along and help with the boats. Yes, sir. Mr. Boxall. Sir? Ask Mr. Wilde where the arms and ammunition are kept. They may be needed later. Yes, sir. Again, something I have to admire the film for is the growing sense of panic throughout it. You start with the passengers being quite calm, but throughout the film, you get quiet shots of things slowly sliding off tables or trolleys rolling to the other side of a room. By this point, you clearly get the sense now that people know the ship is sinking, and things are getting that little bit more desperate. Now we cut to the lowering of lifeboat number six, containing Margaret Brown. Suddenly, though, she notices something. Hey, we only got one sailor with us. That's not enough to manage this boat. Are there any spare hands here? I'll go, if you like. Are you a sailor? I'm a yachtsman. If you're seaman enough to nip down that lifeline, you can go. Below! Now this event is true. The yachtsman in question was Arthur Pushin, a member of the Royal Clarendon Yacht Club. Again, another nice little nod to history here. By the way, a little fact for you. The creaking sounds you hear were not scripted. During the making of the film, they actually found that the set started the creaking making noises of the angle of the sets changed, but the sounds were left in. It may be a little thing, but particularly in the quieter scenes, the creaking does become very ominous as time goes on. Please, Rachel, get in the boat. Yes, Mrs. Krause, you must. I've almost stayed with my husband, Colonel, so why should I leave him now? Please, be sensible. We have been living together for many years, Isidore. Where you go, I go. I'm sure nobody would object to an old gentleman like Mr. Strauss going in a boat. I'll ask the officer. No. I will not go before the other man. We stay. Again, another nice little reference here to an event that happened. Come, Edith Strauss refused to leave her husband Isidore, and they both went down with the ship, although it would be nice in the film if he didn't call her Rachel, since that wasn't her name. Watch your step right. now, you son. Come on. But yes, Dad, I... Wait a minute. He can't go. It's women and children only. Of course he can go. He's only 13. All right, son, go on. You can look after your mother. Ah. This refers to an account by Emily Ryerson, whose son Jack was nearly stopped from entering a boat, although we do not know if it was light or but given that he stopped men from entering the boats earlier, it seems probable. There was also a case where 5th Officer Lowe forced a man, probably though more than a teenager, out of a lifeboat at gunpoint. It's absurd. On the other side, the gentlemen are going in the boats with their ladies. Now this does bring up another part of the sinking. Light Hollow was mainly active on the port side of the ship with the lowering the boats. On the starboard side, some of the boats were lowered by First Officer William Murdoch, who seems to decide that it was women and children first, meaning that he did let some men into the boats. Many were still lowered with space in them though. Explanations for this range from the officers being worried that too many people would capsize the boats, to counts that men were sent below to open the gangway doors and fill the boats from there, although according to Light Hollow, the men he sent below never returned. Whatever the reason, many of the boats left undermanned, which would probably lead to one of the most controversial boats, Lifeboat 1, in which a boat was launched with only 12 people, despite there being room for at least 40. Now whilst there was no Bostwick gate involved here, there is a story of a passenger accidentally getting locked in his own cabin by a steward, and having to be broken up by other passengers, with a steward, who again did not understand that the ship was sinking, saying he would be reported for damaging White Star property. Meanwhile, the officers begin to arm themselves as things start looking even more desperate. Alright lads, leave it now and try and save yourselves. Ah, another nice little reference here. The man sitting reading a book here is meant to be the journalist W.T. Stead, considered one of the founders of modern journalism. 
Ironically, he had written a story some years earlier in which a ship sinks, killing many of its passengers due to a lack of lifeboats, something that must have been on Stead's mind during the sinking. Meanwhile, the captain speaks to Quartermaster Rowe. That's the last one, sir. No reply to your signals? Out. Now, some research in recent years has revealed that, actually, Titanic never did fire all of her rockets, and probably fired quite a few more than were later claimed. Now, the film addresses yet another controversial part of the sinking, the escape of Bruce Ismay in collapsible boat C. It's probable that we will never the exact truth of just how Ismay was allowed into a boat when there were still so many people aboard the ship. Again, I shall link an article below discussing his escape. Meanwhile, the Carpathia gets worrying news from the Titanic. Will you put stewards in every alleyway and tell them that if I see a... What is it, Cotton? From the Titanic, sir. Her engine room's flooded and she's sinking by the head. Her wireless operator says he won't have the power to transmit much longer. Her captain wants to know how long we'll be. In reality, Titanic didn't directly send a message to the Carpathia telling it this. A general message was sent out saying that the engine room was flooded up to the boilers. Now, Lightoller didn't actually fire any shots when loading the boats. This is probably a reference to Lowe again, who fired some shots as he was in a boat being lowered down to warn people against jumping in. Still, though, it does show, yet again, just how desperate things are getting. She's going fast now. Are all the boats away? All except the other two collapsibles. Well, there'll be no time to get them in the Davids. We'll have to try and float them off as she goes down. I need some hands to get them unlashed. Hey, you two! Follow me! If you're wondering what a collapsible boat is, well, on the Titanic, she had 14 wooden boats that could carry at least 65 people, numbered 3 to 16. There were also boats 1 and 2, which were also wooden but smaller, and could carry about 40 people. The remaining four boats were known as collapsible boats, and whilst having a wooden base, they had canvas size that could be raised when needed, hence the term. They could carry about 47 people, and the last two left on the ship, A and B, were stored on the top of the officers' quarters. And now we come to this famous incident. Mr. Guggenheim. Your life though. It was uncomfortable. We have dressed now in our best and are prepared to go down like gentlemen. That is so, sir. But surely... If anything should happen to me, I would like my wife to know that I behaved decently. Thing is, it's probably a myth that Benjamin Guggenheim here ever said it. The steward, Etches, who later reported it, had left the ship quite early on. So if Guggenheim said this, it would have been a lot earlier on, and at a time when Patterson did not know the ship was going to sink, leaving some doubts as to whether this incident actually happened. Soon the remaining passengers begin rushing towards the stern, as Lytoller struggles to free the collapsible boats. Back in the wireless room, the situation is also desperate. Fire's going, John. It's time to go now, Phillips. You've done your duty, you can do no more. Abandon your cabin, it's everyone for himself. Look after yourselves now. I release you both. God bless you. John! John! Not long after this, we get this scene. Hey, you! Live and let live, sir! Uh, live and let live! John! 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 According to Bride, this is more or less what happened, and it would be the last time he would see Phillips. Meanwhile, water begins to flood over the bow of the Titanic as she begins her final descent. 
Captain Smith, in response, decides to do this. Abandon ship! Every man for himself! Now, whilst he did use a megaphone at various times during the sinking, I find it hard to believe he would shout, Abandon ship! at this stage, particularly in regard to his earlier comments that... Everything will be done quietly and calmly. There must be no alarm and no panic. Shouting that to a huge crowd is like shouting fire in a crowded building. The ship's band, meanwhile, having played tunes for the most of the night to calm the passengers, realise they can do no more. It's the end, boys. We've done our duty. We can go now. Hertha! Komm doch schon! Wein nicht! Now, the band playing Nearer My God to Thee is probably one of the more enduring stories of the Titanic. However, debaters rage over the years as to whether this was actually their last tune, or even if they played it at all. To further complicate matters, there are three different tunes to set to, one Anglican, one American, and one Methodist. The Anglican version, Horbury, is the version played in the film. We will never know for sure, but if any version was played, then I personally think it would be this version, although we will never know for sure. Either way, it is good that the film references the bravery of the band. As the ship begins to plunge, Lytol and others are thrown into the water. Meanwhile, panic is completely set in, and now everyone left on the ship is rushing to the stern. Aren't you going to try for it, Mr. Andrews? Now this is yet another enduring image of the Titanic, the ship's creator, standing in the smoking room, looking at a portrait of the entrance to New York Harbour, a location the Titanic would never make. Research later revealed though that this portrait is wrong, and it was actually a portrait of the entrance to Plymouth Harbour, although it wasn't known in 1958 so it can be forgiven. However, we're not sure that Andrews was actually here when the ship sank. A steward claimed that this scene happened, but this was at 1.50am, and some others placed him further forward when the ship went down, although, as with many details that night, we'll probably never know for sure. Titanic now begins to sink rapidly, with the remaining passengers and crew desperately clinging on at the stern. It should be mentioned that in this film the ship does not break in half, but again it was believed at the time that the ship went down in one piece, despite the accounts of some survivors who said otherwise. As the wreck was not found until 1985, then again the film can be excused for this error. Now, if I had to make another comparison to the 1997 version of Titanic, then I must say that the final scene of the stern feels a lot more impactful, at least to me. Instead of just being focused on Jack and Rose, you get a lot more close-up shots of things, such as this steward desperately comforting a lost child. Keep off this child! Keep off this child! Robert's staring towards the boats, knowing that his wife and children are safe at least. Meanwhile, others are kicking and pushing others out of the way, as they desperately seek to survive. Others begin praying, a reference no doubt to farmer Thomas Biles, who had confessions and gave absolution to many passengers before the ship went down. Oh, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. And turn the Titanic slips beneath the waves, although apparently there was not a lot of foaming and frothing of the sea, mind you at least according to accounts. Something I forgot to mention is that the water was flat calm that night, meaning there were no waves, some describing it being like a lake. This is shown in the close-up scenes, but when the scenes of the model are used, they show the sea to be quite rough, which is inaccurate. After the ship has sunk, there are still many people now in the water, crying for help. They need to yet another controversial part of the story, the reactions from the lifeboats as to whether they would go back and pick up survivors. Well, what the hell are we waiting for? Those people are drowning! This boat isn't full, we can go and pick some up and up! Are you mad? If we get among that lot, they'll swamp the boat. They'll capsize us. We can't just sit here and do nothing. Come on, girls. Row! I give the orders round here. Don't you know you're speaking to a lady? I know who I'm speaking to, and I'm in command of this boat. You get fresh with me, son. I'll throw you overboard. 
Come on, roll! Now look here. I tell you, you'll drown a lot of us. Now, whilst Brown did say they should go back, in reality Hitchens, who was command of the boat, got his way and they stayed put. The same story is seen in many of the other boats. Fifth Officer Lowe made probably the most well-known attempt, which is referenced in the film. I still say we ought to turn back. We don't want to get swamped. You heard what he said. We ought to try, I reckon. What do you think, sir? We're crowded enough as it is. I'm feeling most unwell. It's difficult to say. Only one of us is a seaman. I think we ought to take his advice. Well, perhaps if we wait a bit, uh, until things are quietened down, and then, well, then we can try. Wait until they're half dead, you mean? Again, this debate never happened. One man claimed he had suggested to go back, but no one took him up on his suggestion. So Cosmo Duffgord would be ostracised later in life for allegedly bribing the crew not to go back, although he later said it was merely to give them money to replace items they'd lost in the ship. Meanwhile, back on the Californian... That big steamer that was out there, sir, the one that was firing rockets. What about it? Well, she seems to have gone now, sir. Seems to have gone now. And she didn't fire any more rockets. No, sir. Very well. What's the time? 2.45, sir. Well, enter it in the log. Aye, aye, sir. It should be noted that Gibson actually personally reported the captain rather than the stone via speaking tube, at least according to his testimony. A few survivor, though, have found their way to capsules A and B, B being capsized. Among the people to make it here are Harold Bride and the second officer Light Shut up! We'll sink! This boat's not sinking yet. But it soon will be if we don't get organised. It's every man for himself! Shut up and do what the officer says! Here, here! That you, Sparks? Yes, sir. Good. How long before the Carpathia gets here? An hour or so, sir. Right. There's a bit of a swell getting up. We'll have to trim the boat. Now listen to me, all of you! No. Yes, sir. Wait a minute. Yes. Come on, lads. You're all right now. Give me a hand, Sparks. Oh, oh, Take care of the child. Yeah. Now, Lytle never made mention of a child being brought to the boat, but despite that, it is a somewhat sombre moment. About 60 children died on the Titanic, roughly half of the number on board, so it's good that it's referenced. Straighten up! Steady! Left! Lean left! There's one back here dead, sir. Are you certain? We are, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Lower him over the side. Lean left! Lean left! Gently! Gently! All right for the baker to come aboard now, sir? Yes, pull him in! Lean right! Uh. Steady. Thank you, sir. <coughs> I beg your pardon, sir. It's the cold. Now, this is, of course, another part of the story of Charles Jockin, the chief baker. Some have cast doubts on the story, though, in recent years, particularly since, over time, we got more and more exaggerated to the point that he spent over an hour in the water, which, even if he had had a tumble of spirits before the ship went down, is physically impossible. At about 3.30 a.m., the Carpathia arrives on the scene. Slow ahead. Slow ahead, sir. Starboard one point. There's a flare ahead, sir. Fire a rocket. Okay. I tell you, we're done. Oh, oh, shut up. No water, no food. Got no compass, no chart. That's the North Star up there, isn't it? What's the use of that? We're hundreds of miles from land. What was that? Falling star, flash your lightning. Lightning my foot? That was a rocket! Look! It's a rocket! It's a rocket! After the Carpathia sighted, Colonel Gracie and Lytle are talk. Aren't you glad to see her? Yes, I'm glad. But then I'm still alive. If only she'd been nearer. But a 
There's quite a lot of ifs about it, aren't there, Colonel? Keep up, Quartermaster! Keep that line slack! If we'd been steaming a few knots slower, or if we'd sighted that berg a few seconds earlier, we might not even have struck. <sighs> if we'd carried enough lifeboats for the size of the ship instead of just enough to meet the regulations, things would have been different again, wouldn't they? Maybe. But you have nothing to reproach yourself with. You've done all any man could and more. You're not... I was going to say, you're not God, Mr. Lightoller. No seaman ever thinks he is. I've been in sea since I was a boy. I've been in sail. I've even been shipwrecked before. I know what the sea can do. But this is different. Because we hit an iceberg? No. Because we were so sure. Because even though it's happened, it's still unbelievable. I don't think I'll ever feel sure again about anything. Now, whilst this conversation is fictitious and probably inaccurate since Titanic actually carried more lifeboats than the regulations required, for example, I think the final bit of Lightoller's speech sums up a lot of the reasons why the disaster was so impactful at the time and even to this day. In some respects, it ended the Edwardian era and the sense that mankind's progress was unstoppable. After the survivors are picked up, some of them gather to hear a service giving thanks for their rescue. Lightoller, though, is called to see Captain Rostron. Sir? We're at the place now. I thought you'd like to see for yourself. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. We only found one body, I'm afraid. The rest must have been carried further on by the current. But of course, we'll go on searching for survivors until we turn back to New York. Yes. How many? Well, the purser's checked the figures now. We have on board 705 survivors. Several of those in the boats were dead, I'm afraid. 1,500 lost? That's right, yes. Excuse me, sir. Oh, Cotton, yes, what is it? A message from the Californian, sir. She's nearby. Just heard about the Titanic. Wants to know if there's anything she can do. Wait, did you say she sent a message? Well, it's funny because in real life she should be here. She actually turned up just as the Carpathia recovered the last lifeboats and was photographed right alongside Carpathia and then continued to look for survivors whilst Carpathia headed to New York. Tell them no, nothing. Everything that was humanly possible has been done. And so ends the film. As I mentioned at the start of the review, A Night to Remember is one of my favourite movies of all time. In terms of accuracy, I think it does a pretty good job, all things considered. There are quite a few errors, some of which can be explained by a lack of understanding of events at the time, others not so much. Not to mention a lot of technical details regarding the layout of the ship, which I did not really have time to go into during the review. Again, see Paul Lee's page if you wish to see a more depth look at the inaccuracies. What I think the film does best, though, is capture the feel of the disaster. The film has very much an ensemble cast, and you get to look at the disaster from all angles, the officers, the crew, first, third class, etc. Whilst its effects may be dated by today's standards, I think it is by far one of the best films on the Titanic disaster, and I would strongly recommend it. Thank you for watching, this has been The Laughing Cavalier, wishing you a good day.